Well, aloha. Oh, that's great. Hano, hano i kea kua. Aloha kea kua ia oi. Pehe oi. Ah, mai ka i, mai ka i no. The Hawaiian Bible says, no ka mea me ka i e hova ma loa kono loko ma ka i. Me kono o io io ho i naha na una apau. And of course, you know by now what that means. For the Lord is good. His loving kindness is everlasting and his faithfulness to all generations. Well, Pastor Jay is on the mainland today ministering in Colorado, but he'll be back tomorrow. And he sends his warmest love and aloha and prayers for this service and to each and every one of you. He misses you and he's looking forward to getting back home. Speaking of traveling pastors, did you know that John Wesley preached over 40,000 sermons and traveled over 225,000 miles by horseback? And he did this until he was 88 years old. I love it. My kind of guy. Did you know that George Mueller, George Mueller, he traveled 200,000 miles preaching in six different languages to over three million people. And he did this between the ages of 70 and 87. I like that. Or did you know that Cam Townsend, affectionately known as Uncle Cam, the founder of Wycliffe Bible Associates, he began learning the Russian language to translate the entire Bible into the Russian language when he was 72 years old. Or how about Daniel? You remember Daniel thrown into the lion's den? Not when he was a kid, but when he was 80 years old. Or how about David Sizer? David Sizer, I like him. He enrolled in Bible college when he was 95 years old, and then he graduated, and he was preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ in jails and prisons every week until the age of 101. So for those of you this morning who feel like your future is behind you, take hope. You are never too old for God. And you may say, well, David, that's fine. I've heard that before. But, 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 but I'm not John Wesley. I'm not George Mueller. I'm not David Sizer. Uh, and, and maybe that's, that's good for them. But David, I'm just tired. Well, I understand. <laughs> that's understandable. If you're of average weight and height, did you know what your body's going to go through in the next 24 hours? Just in the next 24 hours. Now, Dr. Stan will probably correct me on this, but uh, uh, here's what they say. Your heart will beat 103,689 times in the next 24 hours. Your blood will travel 168 million miles as your heart pumps approximately four ounces per beat. You will breathe... 23,040 times inhaling 483 cubic feet of air. And if you're a man in the next 24 hours, you'll speak about 4,800 words. If you're a woman, you'll speak about 70 million words. No, no, I, I don't. I, I mean, I mean 7,000 words. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. You'll move about 750 muscles, and you'll exercise about 7 million brain cells. No wonder we're tired. But if you're tired this morning, or if you know of someone who, who's tired, I've got good news. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 11, verse 28, Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, 
and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Now, when Jesus said this, who did he invite? He invited those who were weary, those who were tired. Have you in your life ever experienced a tiredness uh, that, that, that's even more draining than physical fat fatigue. You know what I'm talking about. It goes beyond just being physically tired. Have you ex ever experienced a kind of weariness when you just don't know if you can go on another day? Uh, kind of like a weariness that a wife feels when her husband's rejected her. Or like a weariness that a, a, a friend feels who's been betrayed. A, a weariness that takes a toll on even the strongest of individuals. Jesus knows. Jesus knows. At this point in Matthew's gospel, Israel, the entire nation, was rejecting him. Religious leaders were, were, were accusing him. And, and one of his very disciples would soon betray him. But did you notice in this passage who Jesus invites? He didn't say, come to me, all of you who are religious, and let's theologize. He didn't say, come to me, all of you who are wise, and let's philosophize. He invited those who were plain old, weary, and worn out. And those who were discouraged and defeated. And did you, did you notice here that he didn't say, run to me? He just said, come. Just come, stumble, walk, crawl. Just come, just come any way you can, just come. And I will give you rest. 175 years before Jesus, Antiochus Epiphanes, he was a very, very popular politician. He was a powerful public speaker. He had a core of followers that would follow him to the death. And he convinced the people of Syria to crown him, not only king of Syria, but king of Israel as well. So what did he do? He invaded Israel. 40,000 Jews were immediately killed, and by the time his anger was vented, over 100,000 Jews had been slaughtered. And then, and then came the abomination of desolation. Epiphanes, can you picture this? He went into the temple in Jerusalem, and he killed a pig on the altar of the temple. And then he smeared the blood of the pig on the walls of the temple. And then he forced the Jewish priests to drink the remainder of the blood. And then he erected a statue of himself and demanded that the people worship it. It was a sickening, vile scene. And it was at that time that one family said, we have had enough. They decided to stand up to this madman. You Bible scholars, you historians, you remember them. They became known as the Maccabees. Do you remember Judah and his brother? You remember them? They launched a guerrilla warfare against Epiphanes. And it went on for nearly 10 years. But eventually, they overthrew the Syrians and threw them out of Jerusalem. You see, Judah... And his brothers, they knew the word of God. And they knew the God of the word. They studied the lives and the writings of the early prophets. And they studied the book of Daniel. And Daniel wrote in chapter 11, verse 12, the second half of that verse, the people who know their God Will, shall stand firm and take action. The King James Version of the Bible says, the people that do know their God shall be strong and do exploits. 
I love it. The, the, the English word exploits used in this passage literally means bold deeds and daring acts. That's what it means in the original Hebrew language. So how could Judah and his brothers overcome seemingly insurmountable odds and experience victory? Well, just maybe they had also studied the life of David and his mighty men, for they had that record. They had that scripture found in 2 Samuel chapter 23. So grab your Bibles. I'm sure you brought your Bibles to church this morning. Grab your Bibles. Grab the Word of God, and let's dig into this passage. 2 Samuel chapter 23, beginning in verse 8. 2 Samuel 23, verse 8. The Bible says, these are the names of the mighty men whom David had. Joshua Bashabeth, a Tachmanite, he was chief of the three. He wielded his spear against 800 whom he killed at one time. And next to him, among the three mighty men, was Eleazar, the son of Dodo, son of Ahohi. He was with David when they defied the Philistines who were gathered there for battle, and the men of Israel withdrew. He rose and struck down the Philistines until his hand was weary and his hand clung to the sword. And the Lord brought about a great victory that day, and the men returned after him only to strip the slain. Verse 11, next to him was Shammah, son of A.G. the Herorite. The Philistines gathered together at Lehi, where there was a plot of ground full of lentils. And the men fled from the Philistines, but he took, but he stood, took his stand in the midst of the plot and defended it and struck down the Philistines, and the Lord worked a great victory. Now, this passage describes a season in David's life when he was being hunted by King Saul. Saul never let up. In his all-consuming passion to hunt down and to destroy David, the Bible says King Saul and his armies had overrun and occupied the town of Bethlehem, and David and his boys were holed up there in the Rephraim Valley. Bethlehem, as you know, was about three miles to the south. Jerusalem was about three miles to the north. Old Saul, he could smell blood. So he sent out his crack warriors, to finish off David and his boys once and for all. They came by the thousands. David and his boys were hopelessly outnumbered, but, but Saul made one big mistake. Saul understand, under, misunderstood, underestimated the commitment of David's men to their king. Well, who were these men? Well, I'm glad you asked. Some of them... Some of them were in trouble with the law. Some were hopelessly in debt. Others were looked down upon because of their youth or their lack of education. Most, in fact, were misfits in society. But they all had one thing in common. Complete and absolute devotion to King David. They spent time with their king. They knew their king. They had faith in their king. And when faced with adversity, they didn't turn tail and run. So when the enemy surrounded them, what did they do? Well, I'm glad you asked. The Bible says in verse 8 that Joshua Beshebeth lifted up his spear and he slew 800 of the enemy at one time. The Bible says he lifted up his hands 800 times and overcame 800 of the enemy single-handedly. 800 times is a lot of lifting up of the hands, isn't it? Try lifting a 10-pound spear 800 times. 800 times. Just try lifting up your hands without anything 800 times. Those spears in those days weighed more than 10 pounds. In 1 Timothy, the Apostle Paul exhorted men everywhere to lift up holy hands in prayer. You, you Bible scholars, 
you Bible students, you remember the account in Exodus when Joshua was, was down fighting in the valley below against the, against the enemy. And, and you remember that whenever Moses, who was up on the hilltop above, whenever he lifted up his hands in prayer, that, that Joshua prevailed over the enemy. You remember that story. And, and you remember when, when Moses, when his hands got tired and he had to lower his hands down, that the enemy prevailed in, in battle. And then you remember when Moses, with his friends giving him a hand, lifted those hands back up again, the enemy was defeated. So the first principle in being a mighty man or a mighty woman of God, in doing bold deeds and daring acts, the first principle in overcoming adversity is simply lifting holy hands up in prayer. Not just once, but over and over again and over and over again. Uh, now you may say, David, my, my hands aren't holy. I, I, I'm not holy, in, but, but, but you're wrong. The Bible says, as Christians, our hands are holy in his sight. We're made clean. We're made holy through the blood of the Lamb of God, Jesus Christ. Second, the disciples didn't ask Jesus to teach them how to pray. The Bible says nowhere teach us how to pray. Nowhere do we see that in Scripture. The Bible says simply, teach us to pray. God's not impressed with our oratorical skills. He's looking at our heart. So don't try to copy the prayers of others. Robin and I live in a small home, just one bedroom, one bathroom, but we do have an art gallery in our home. It, it, art gallery has original pieces of art, masterpieces. The art gallery happens to be on the door of our refrigerator, and the original masterpieces of art, you might scratch your head saying, I don't quite recognize that. I'll say, well, that's a picture of a dog, and that's a picture of a house, and see the flowers? The colors aren't quite in the lines, but there they are. Our grandchildren made that for us, original pieces of art, and to us, it's worth more than the most expensive reproduction we could ever get. You are unique. You are special. God knows you. Just be yourself and pray to him just the way you are. Third, it's important to understand why our loving Heavenly Father wants us to lift up our prayers. Not just eight times, not just 80 times, not even 800 times or more, but over and over and over again until our prayers are answered. You say, David, why doesn't the Lord just hear, simply hear my prayer and answer it the first time? Is he teasing me? Is he playing hard to get? Why do I need to come to him over and over and over again? The answer is quite simple because he loves you. He loves you. He loves me. And he loves hearing from us. And if the Lord answered all of our prayers the very first time, every time, he may not hear from us all that much. And when I come back to him over and over and over again, I find it really wasn't about my prayer request after all. It really wasn't about my need after all. It was all about me spending time with him. He wants to spend time with us. So the first principle in becoming a mighty man or a mighty woman of God in overcoming adversity is faithfulness in prayer. Lifting up holy hands in prayer, not just once, not just twice, but over and over and over again. Next in this passage we read of Eleazar. You remember him? The son of Dodo? You know, you had to be mighty just to survive with a last name like that. Here he is, Mr. Dodo. But here he is. The Bible says that Eleazar hung on tight, so tight to the sword, that after the battle was over and the victory was won, that his hand was weary and clung to the sword. The King James Bible says his hand clave to the sword. The Hebrew word for clave there is yada. 
And the first time we ever find this Hebrew word yada in the Old Testament is in the book of Genesis. And it describes the intimacy between Adam and Eve. How they knew each other intimately. Likewise, God wants us to know him intimately. So the second key principle in overcoming adversity is faithfulness in the word. You oughta yada. The Bible says the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. The sword represents the Bible, the word of God. The spear represents our prayers to the God of the word. It's one thing to know the word of God. It's another thing to know the God of the word. So may that sword, may God's word, may this book be a part of you. David said, thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. This is the word of God. Have you made it a part of your life? Do you open up the word of God daily? Do you read it? Not just books about the Bible. Not just books about theology and all that stuff. Those are all books written by man. Do you, re- do you pick up God's word and read it and memorize portions of it? Or does it just slide easily from your hand to sit on your coffee table or by your nightstand only to bring to church the next Sunday? The third key principle is seen in the life of Shammah. We read in verse 11 about faithfulness in service. I love the story of Shammah. I can imagine him approaching David, being one of David's mighty men, and saying, David, I got my sword and I got my spear. And David, I'm ready to die for you. I'm ready to lay down my life for you. I'm ready to do what you want me to do. Do you want me to serve on the northern front or the western front? Actually, since we're surrounded, how about the eastern front or the southern front? I'm ready to go. He was ready to go to battle. And and David looked Shammah in the eyes and said, Shammah, I would like you to go back to the kitchen and guard the beans. That word lentils in the King James Bible simply means food or provision or beans. What a disappointment. What a disappointment to a mighty man, a mighty warrior, to go back to the kitchen. That's where the women and the children were. But Shammah picked up his spear and picked up his sword and said, All right, sir, I'll do that. And he went back and stood there in the kitchen. Well, the Bible says that the enemy broke through the front line. They broke through, and they made their way to that piece of ground full of lentils, and Shammah stood up and defended the ground, the Bible said, and slew the Philistines, and the Lord brought about a great victory that day. Shammah became the best bean garter this world has ever seen. He did the job that he was trained to do. What job have you been trained to do? What job has your king called you to do? Stand your ground. Don't give up. Be faithful in service to your king. After graduating from high school, a young man by the name of Tom Benton enlisted in the United States Marine Corps. He was an average student at best, Second string on the football team, C minus average in high school. After going through basic training in San Diego, advanced training in Camp Pendleton, he was assigned his first tour of duty in Hawaii. Tom, being from California, was pretty excited to be assigned in Hawaii. He met another young Marine, also from California. And those two became best of friends. Oh, and the weekends, every Saturday, they'd go out and they would go surfing or they'd go skin diving. They had a great time. But every Saturday night, Tom's friend would invite him to go to church. Tom would always make the same reply, no, I, uh, I, I don't need to go to church. I've never been to church in my life. I'm not interested in religion or God or any of that stuff. You go ahead and go, and I'll meet you after church, and we'll go surfing after church. 
Well, this went on week after week, month after month. And Tom's friend tried to put a Bible under the pillow of his bunk and tried to shove a little gospel track down the muzzle of his M14, but that didn't accomplish anything either. Finally, after nine months, Tom, when he was invited to go to church by his friend, said, okay, I'll go to church with you tomorrow. And Tom's friend was, wow, was it the Bible I gave you? Was it the track? What? Tom said, no, I'm not interested in church. I'm not interested in religion. I'm not interested in God. I'm just going to go to church with you because you're, because you're my best friend. You know, gang, people really don't care how much we know until they know how much we care. Tom went to church not because he was interested in religion. He went to church because he had a friend. And there at that church, the International Baptist Church in Honolulu, Hawaii, Tom heard that gospel message proclaimed by Pastor Jim Cook. And he couldn't wait for that sermon to be over to come down and shake that preacher's hand and said, Preacher, I want to accept Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. And he did so that very Sunday. It was four days later, as a complete surprise to those two young Marines, that they found their way to, uh, to the uh, airport and onboarded plane bound for Vietnam. It was September of 1967. Eleven days after arriving in Vietnam, Tom and his friend were assigned to, to, uh, to just serve on a very small hill in what was the northernmost part of South Vietnam, near the, right, basically on the demilitarized zone. Tom's job, very simply, was to drop mortars in a mortar tube, it would shoot up and down and provide supporting fire for the Marines at the bottom of the hill in case they were ever attacked. Eleven days after arriving in Vietnam, the stillness of the night air was shattered by the screaming of rockets, artillery shells, and what was the heaviest concentration of enemy firepower ever amassed against American troops in the history of the Vietnam War to that point. Young Marines dying, killed on the top of that hill, and that was followed by wave after wave of North Vietnamese Army regular troops rushing up that hill, and soon those Marines down at the bottom of that hill were engaged in hand-to-hand -hand combat. They were overrun. They were vastly outnumbered, and there was no hope that any of them would survive the night unless they received some supporting fire from above. And so Tom, brand new Christian, prayed a prayer, a simple prayer, it went like this. Dear God, give me the strength to do the job that I've been trained to do. And with that, Tom jumped up out of the relative safety of his foxhole, ran across the top of that hill, and began dropping those mortars down that mortar tube, giving supporting fire for those young Marines who were engaged in hand-to-hand -hand combat at the bottom of that hill. The inevitable happened. A rocket came screaming in, landed at Tom's feet, exploded, killed him instantly. Another Marine jumped up, took Tom's position. He too was killed. And finally, a third continued providing supporting fire from the top of that hill to those young Marines overrun at the bottom of that hill. When the battle was over and the sun had come up, that little hill called Khan Tien was still in Marine Corps hands that night. I was thankful for what Tom Benton did that night on the top of that little hill called Khan Tien because I was one of those young Marines down at the bottom of the hill. And there's no way that I would be here, Kihei Baptist Chapel, this morning 
except a man lay down his life for his friends. One of the most difficult things that I've ever had to do is to walk up to the top of that little hill the next morning when the battle was over and the sun was up and put the body of my best friend, Tom Benton, into that plastic bag to be sent back home to California for a Christian burial. My parents attended that funeral. As you probably surmised by now, I was that other Marine back in Hawaii who stumbled and bumbled, tried and failed to share his faith in Jesus Christ. But Tom gave his life so that a few of us would live to face another battle and a fortunate few of us would be able to return back home to this great country. 2,000 years ago, another man voluntarily walked up a very small hill and willingly sacrificed his own life, not only so that we would be victorious in the daily battles that we face, but he gave his life so that we wouldn't have to fight anymore. The Bible says, set yourselves apart. Stand ye still, for the battle is not yours. It's mine, says the Lord God of hosts. Jesus put it another way when he said, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. So if you're going through adversity right now, know this. God is in control. Hang in there. Don't give up. Don't question what God is doing. D.L. Moody said God can do a lot with a little if he has all there is of that little. So first, gang, be faithful in prayer. Second, be faithful in the word. Third, be faithful faithful in service. Be faithful wherever he has planted you. Stand. Stand your ground. And if you apply these three principles in your life, you will overcome whatever adversity the enemy may throw your way. How do I know? The Bible tells me so. You watch you wait. You'll see. So, gang, love God radically. Trust God courageously. Obey him joyfully. Why? Because his plans for you and for this church are good. How do I know? The Bible tells me so. Let's pray. Father, thank you so very, very much that we don't have to fight anymore. Thank you, Lord, that your yoke is easy and your burden is light. Thank you, Father, that we can just trust and rest in Oh, God, that we would be a people that lift up our hands to you daily, repeatedly, over and over and over again. We know what bunch of knuckleheads we are, but we thank you, Lord, that our hands are holy in your sight, not by what we do or don't do, only because of the blood of Jesus Christ that washes us, makes us clean and perfect in your sight. Oh, God, 
May we be a people that picks up your word daily. Not just at church, not just reading about theology, but digging into your word. Going through your word, verse by verse, chapter by chapter, book by book, and memorizing your word that we might not sin against you. Only in your word is there life. May we be a people of your word. Finally, Lord, I pray that we would be faithful in growing where we have been planted, doing what you've called us to do, being faithful in the small and trusting you for the big. Oh, God, may we make changes in our life this week. May it be less about us, more about you, less about church, and more about Jesus. Thank you, Father, that you want us to be more conformed into the image of your Son, not by what we do, but by allowing you to work through us, in us, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you guys. Simple message. I'm just a simple old guy. But you're never too old for God. Amen? Let's stand.